All right, good morning everyone. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue. Welcome online and in person to Concordia University's fourth space. Thanks so much for joining us for today's workshop, Demystifying the Public Art Process. This workshop will be facilitated by Pascal Girardin, who's here in the space with us. I'm just going to say a few words to help get you situated and give you a little context as to where you are right now as you're joining us online and in person. So take your time to kind of settle in. We are streaming to YouTube live from Forspace, and Forspace is located on Antida Indigenous lands here in Jage, Montreal. What we do here in this uh, particular location online and obviously in person um, is work with our community to connect people to the ongoing research projects and various university initiatives that are brewing here at Concordia through daily activities that really invite engagement uh, with the goal of mobilizing and sharing knowledge. So it's our great pleasure to work with uh, the public art lead here at Concordia, Sandra Morgolian, to make this event happen. Of course, with Pascal Girardin as well, who will be today's host. And I'll be passing the mic in just a sec, but um, just wanted to let you know, those of you who are joining us online, it's great to see you in that space. You're more than welcome to, throughout uh, the workshop, turn your cameras on and kind of ask questions. I'm sure Pascal will uh, give you some prompts and, and uh, moments to jump in also with questions and comments. You can put those in the chat if you're more comfortable doing so, but if you just wanna speak, you know, turn on your camera, raise a hand, and we'll be able to see and hear you here in the space. And if you're joining us in person, once again, make yourselves comfortable around that table. We'll put a couple of these microphones around the table so that when you speak, um, if you do have questions as well, people on Zoom can hear you uh, so that we're all in the same kind of uh, space together. Okay, that's it for me. I'm going to now pass the floor um, to my colleague Sandra, oh, sorry, Sandra, Cynthia Alphonse. And Cynthia will be tell you, tell you a little bit more about the Honoring Black per Presence uh, Public Art Program, which is uh, kind of why we've all come together here today. So over to you, Cynthia. Thank you. Um, so uh, as Anna mentioned, my name is Cynthia Alphonse and I am the project coordinator for the President's Task Force on Anti-Black Racism. Um, the mandate of the task force was to come up with uh, a set of recommendations to address anti-Black racism at the university and the way that it impacts um, Black faculty, staff, and students. Um, we submitted our final report back in October 20, uh, yeah, 2020 on October 28 with 88 recommendations, which were all accepted by the university, so we were happy about that. Um, one of the recommendations were, was to um, honor the presence of Black people, the continued Black presence of Black people, people at the university through the arts, and to also bring visibility to Black artists. And so this is how um, this public art program came to light. And so for the past two years, myself and Sandra Margolian, who is the public art lead uh, at the university, We've been working on building this program together, which will go over for the next 12 years with um, three iterations, no, four iterations of three years each. Um, each iteration, uh, one artist or a group of artists will be able to showcase their, um, their artistry. And so we were finally able to launch this, uh, this program back in May. So we're accepting applications until the end of this month. Um, so very excited. <laughs> um, and so as part of the, the program to help out um, with the application process, knowing that um, you know, what goes into public art may be a bit different from other types of commission, we are offering um, this workshop today. Uh, and this workshop will be led by Pascal Girardin, who is an instructor in the Faculty of Fine Arts uh, at the university. Um, she has extensive experience in public art um, projects, um, one of which uh, can be found in the Fort Season Hotel. The, it's called uh, Contemplation, which is an eight feet uh, suspended sculpture. Um, before I leave you off with Pascal uh, in good hand, I just want to say thank you everyone, both here and online, for showing interest in this program. I was saying earlier how this, um, this particular program is really close to my heart, um, and so I'm really happy to be able to see it come to fruition bit by bit. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah, 
uh, uh, but I just wanted to take a, a moment first to just uh, present myself. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, is my microphone uh, on? Yeah? OK. Um, well, uh, thank, thank you for inviting me uh, to do this. Uh, I'm very excited about it. And um, uh, when I was asked to contribute my experiences, um, I readily accepted the invitation. Um, and my goal in giving this workshop is to empower each in, of you in your creative endeavors and contribute to a vibrant culture honoring Black presence in public art. Uh, I also want to de demystify the notion of professional success uh, by emphasizing the incremental nature of large-scale projects, uh, which often entail both small wins and occasional setbacks. Um, so this guide is um, um, this guide offers a customized approach to developing organizational and communication skills necessary for achieving your public art objectives within your unique. Um, studio and artistic practices. I'm very nervous. <laughs> um, so, um, so yeah, so I'm just going to start, I guess I'll just go back and sit down, but I just wanted to take that moment. Um, I'll calm down, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to share the screen now to start the, um, start the uh, presentation. And uh, <laughs> starting on a rough patch, but <laughs> this is, um, the, yes, and here I am talking about organizing, right? <laughs> so living, living proof. <laughs> um, all right, so um, I'm just trying to get this a little. Okay, so the, uh, what's, oh, there's the, uh, there's a chat that's there. Okay, so. Right, so the, uh, how we're going to be working today, we have in the morning, we're going to be talking about really the nuts and bolts of uh, preparing for public art. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, dealing with budgets, dealing with lead time, dealing with uh, the scope of the project, your own studios, and how you have to think about, you know, um, what your capabilities are and what the uh, the mandates of the the proposals are and communications uh, super important to understand that communications are really a key to make sure that you are uh, addressing the right people that you're also getting all the information that you need so that you can actually make those that art happen and of course lastly teamwork uh, which i'm going to talk a lot about because in public art we generally work um, with a lot of other people that are involved. And again, communication comes back and loops into that as well. Um, so, uh, how do I, how do, oh yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, so the art call, uh, depending on the project and the organizational structures, uh, team members inside the, the people who are doing the art call will vary greatly. So um, it can come from different organizations. It can come from the Ministère de la Culture, de Communication et de la Condition Féminine, which is the MCCCF. Um, they do the what we call the 1% uh, projects, which are 1% of any institution or uh, building that has had financing from the government there's a, um, a decree that they have to use 1% of the overall budget that they've used for um, renovating or constructing in uh, purchasing an art piece. And so that's a very specific kind of organization. Um, so we will be, I'll be talking a little bit about their structure, but there's also other types of public art, which, which can come from other types of organization, whether they're public or private. And uh, then there's, all, you know, there's also um, art consultants and art galleries that might have access to um, you know, uh, buildings and spaces where they need art. So how do you deal and work with that? And then there's also private clients um, that also have um, uh, interest in, in uh, having art. So it's less public maybe, but uh, sometimes uh, sometimes it is as well. And some of these 
all of these will apply. It just becomes a little bit more sim simplified as we get into those different tiers. Um, so just to get into the 1%, um, they are organized into groups of six people each time. So this, just by the way, it, the 1% um, of the MCCF, I didn't put a link on that, but I can uh, certainly do that during the lunch hour if you want to find out more about the programs. Um, those, uh, um, they, you need to get your artwork approved into the art bank. And once it's in the art bank, then you will be part of the artists and the artworks that they will be shuffling through as they're looking for something for these projects. Um, so this one, for the 1%, you always have a specialist, which is an artist, who um, is professional and they've been designated by the government the, to sit on selection committees. Um, so they view uh, the project from the artist's perspective. So they make sure that uh, the committee that is there understands that what an artist is, is expressing and they may be able to uh, give more information to uh, people who are maybe not so familiar within the group um, on you know art <laughs> Some, sometimes that happens um, and so um, they i'm oh, sorry i just want to get that back here right and so uh, the uh, this person participates in all of the steps that uh, lead towards the integration or the acquisition of public art and establishing the program. They determine the nature and the location of the work and they select the artists. They help in the selection of the artists that uh, the ministry um, inside that database that we're t I was talking about. When you want to apply, you have to go through a certain selection uh, committee, but once you're in, you're in the database. Uh, so they will, at the end, recommend the approval of a proposed work but they're not the only ones. So there's six people that will be voting on that. So I'm giving you a little bit of an ABC on the 1%, but I think it's important that you understand that uh, structure. Um, regional experts are also artists that are involved in uh, these, uh, in the, this com these types of committees. Um, and uh, they uh, participate in the second stage of the integration, uh, so mainly to recommend to the members on the choice of the various artists who are going to submit a proposal. So they will go maybe from 30 artists, there's 300 or more artists in the database, so they might, you know, uh, whittle it down to 30, and then from there they'll say, well, I think these three should go into competition. And uh, so that will be part of the, uh, that first part of the artist, um, the artist call. Then there's always a client's representative. Uh, so th that usually is the, let's say uh, it's an institution like a school. So the client's representative would be, uh, for example, a the director, uh, the, the principal of the school. So uh, usually um, they will designate a representative to act on, be on their behalf and is appointed by the group and the, uh, the, uh, the, the client's board of directors. So that's uh, usually like it could be a municipal council or whatnot. So this person will participate in all the stages of the integration. Uh, then there's the end user's uh, representative, which usually would be, for example, if it was a hospital, it might be the, the direction, uh, the nurse, the nurse, head nurses of or whatever the, their title is, uh, they might be there to represent um, the, uh, the uh, end user, or they will be representing the population that is using the, the um, that is using, that is in that space. So, and then of course, there's always a ministry's representative, and there will be always an architect, which is the person who has been involved uh, in the renovation or the construction of the place. So it's, it's a six person committee and there's a, a, a large process. Uh, it's quite long uh, before they eventually choose an artist. And once, uh, once they've chosen the artist, then you will start the actual uh, production of the piece. So um, that was for the, M the MCCCF. Uh, but public art uh, can be commissioned by other types of organizations, such as here at Concordia. Um, and uh, so it'll really depend on the size and the scope of a project. 
And um, uh, so, yeah, so there might be uh, the, the people that will be on the, those committees, you know, they might be appointed uh, in various, various ways. Uh, so the first one here that I'm speaking about, because these are my experiences more in, in the private public uh, sector, uh, there might be an interior designer or an interior architect uh, that will be responsible uh, for the overall planning of, an, of a space. And they usually hold relevant information to start the project. So budget, what's the budget? What's the lead time? Uh, plans, elevations, everything that you need to start the project. Um, then there's a project manager often on the larger project. So let's say I'm just going to talk uh, about, uh, let's say it's a big hotel uh, and they want to do something in a lobby. So they will be building this place and they're preparing to have the artwork. The artwork always comes at the end mm -hmm. because you need to, you know, do the floors and the ceilings and everything and you don't want to have dust and you don't want to have a messy environment or something that could damage the artwork. So in a large project like that, they will have a project manager who oversees the completion of a project within budget and on schedule. That's their job. So they're always just, you know, where's everybody at on, on these projects? Um, they will provide leadership uh, and effectively coordinate activities. Um, so sometimes um, the client will suggest uh, working with the general contractor on site, you might have to deal with the general contractor. Those are things that can happen. Uh, and then you might have in the general contractor here, which would be the next person, that's a person who's really on uh, the construction site. Uh, they assist in planning and implementing artwork with co within construction schedule. So if it's a very large uh, sculpture that you're doing or, or installation or whatnot, you might have to speak to a general contractor just to get some information or it might be you might be speaking to the project manager who will say let me talk to the GC to see like what's going on did we um, did we strengthen the ceiling to make sure your artwork will hold or, or did they put a backing on the wall so and that might they might not have the information they might have to send it to the architect so the architect might be involved in those types of projects as well so um, they're rarely on public uh, projects in my experience i've rarely had to speak to the architect but in the with the one percent there's always an architect and they're the ones that usually have plans elevations and all that technical stuff that you need um, and then there might be a lighting designer or an electrician that you might have to deal with if they, you know, if you want to talk about lighting and how they might ask you, often they'll ask you, say, how do you imagine the lighting on your work? And, you know, if it's your first time, it's kind of hard to decide. You're like, well, I don't know, a uh, spotlight or something. And so you want to talk to, um, ask, well, do you have a lighting designer? Do you have an electrician? Those are questions you can ask. If they don't have them, uh, you might want to talk to the interior designer. They might have some great ideas, you know. So it's like, it's basically about finding out who all these different people are, their titles and their roles, so that you're able to have those conversations and not feel alone making those decisions like that's something that like I really really stress a lot about this workshop is that not to do things alone and you want to feel supported so um, so then and then you might have a building engineer so building engineers those are very important in situations where the artwork needs to be secured it's uh, heavy it's overhanging I don't know you know just some the situation like that so you might be asked on a public project to have an engineer seal and for that you need to find an engineer uh, that hopefully specializes in art. Um, I don't have a large list of uh, people, but I'm going to try to, you know, if you guys have questions um, later, I can always kind of look through my database and see if I can uh, sort that out. Um, so yeah, so the engineers can be commissioned to verify that the artwork meets safety standards. Uh, they can give recommendations about the weight or the strength resistance of materials of, your, of the material you're using. For example, in some cases, it's your responsibility to have your drawings approved by an engineer, uh, while at other times responsibility lies with the client. So uh, you need to establish that at the beginning of the process and to clarify um, that situation. 
Um, and then, uh, yeah, so there might be a client's uh, representative once again. Uh, they may attend meetings, but usually it's a designer who relays the, the information to the client's representative, uh, uh, yeah, the to the client. Um, so yeah, so, so now we're getting into smaller projects and smaller projects such as private clients. So there's usually a lot less people involved in that. Um, so, you know, you might want to ask a client if they have an interior designer. I do that because I don't like to come into a home and say, yes, I want this here or there. So I always want to make sure that it makes sense with whatever is around. But sometimes they don't have any and they trust you and then it's the responsibilities on you to make, make the, you know, that decision where you think it should go. Um, but yeah, I, I tend to want to make sure first, you know, that maybe there's somebody else that can hold my hand while I, <laughs> I make that decision. Um, so yeah, so th that person would also, if there was an interior designer involved, they would be, uh, they would hold all that, the information that you'll need, budget, lead time, um, plans, elevations, and if they don't have plans and elevations, there's probably a general contractor on the project and they would uh, be able to like get you that information. Um, I think, yeah, so then it's something that, you know, I don't know why I wrote conclusion, but it's just <laughs> more something to, to, sorry, you get all these documents together, then you reread them. Um, yeah, so it is important to um, understand the scope and the scale of the proposals that, that are being, if it's an art call, um, and evalu evaluating whether to apply, uh, to consider your studio specificities and practice. Sometimes something looks really amazing, the budget, or you're looking at the budget, you're like, ooh, you know? But then it's like, eh, I don't know, it's like I don't really have that, you know, that I don't usually work in this way, and that it sounds like it might be a little complicated for me. So it is kind of, you know, it's up to you to decide how much risk you want to take but also to try to see like if it's more compatible or not. There are a lot of art calls out there, um, but yeah, choosing is really important to start with. And you do want to start um, by something that you feel very comfortable about and confident. So uh, yeah, so your project should be in line with, yes, yeah. to assess the risk, what what is that risk? Uh, weight of a, a, a piece, well, it could, uh, the weight, yeah, assessing the weight of the materials. For example, if you're doing a, a big sculpture and it's going into a park uh, and it's made of um, uh, sheet aluminum, but then you might have to consider things like the wind, you know, like it, could it flex or, you know, will it be uh, properly set into the ground? I mean, that stuff, that's what engineers are, are for and they're great at that. They, they give you incredible recommendations and then they put the seal of approval once the drawings have been completely uh, uh, finalized. Yeah, something like that. It could be if you're hanging something from, from a ceiling and you need to have uh, either blocking in the ceiling or hidden beams and or or maybe they're visible beams but can they they can they support the weight so then you need to have those questions addressed so there'll be a lot of communication involved in that yeah any other questions I'd be more than happy to uh... thank you Hi, hello. Um, are there, I'm assuming there's some uh, safety considerations also concerning, for instance, sharp sharp edges and uh, I don't yes, know, yes. for a large, let's say, piece um, and, going into a public space. Yes. Is and, that on us? I mean, obviously. Yes, so. it is on your side, but they will specify. So you know, as safety, uh, for example, like you said, sharp edges, uh, whether you can climb on a sculpture, that could be a safety issue. Uh, so those things are on you to think about those things. I've seen uh, projects be refused from colleagues of mine because uh, you could easily climb on it and there was a lot of children, it's in a public space, you know, so it was like, uh, you know, that it, she thought about it afterwards, she went, oh, you know, had I added another three feet on that it, or one meter, uh, that would have been uh, you know, that would have been a game changer. So, and that's something also uh, in the 1%, uh, when you do your, your proposal and you, you present it to the committee, it's final, 
Whereas often in other types of art calls, you can do the adjustments. You know, they might say, you know, we love it. We've chosen your work. However, you'll need to change this. But in the 1%, because it's this, it's a very regimented and uh, yeah, so it's like your, your final, your final ideas is the one that's being taken. Any other questions? All right. So, um, the elements of a public art call. It's, um, and all this, uh, these uh, files will be, this file will also be available to you when um, I, I have uh, put most of it on Google Drive, but I think this one I was keeping it for the morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so these are really the basic, you know, budget, lead time, the scope of the project, uh, your communications, teamwork, and the last one, I added it, file management, because organizing your files is really helpful. And uh, especially if you want to go back three or four years down the road and go, oh, what was that project? When was that? And what did I do? I, I remember some, some problem that arose and we figured it out or something like that. So um, yeah, so the budget. Uh, so your studio specific setup uh, and the scope of the project impacts your costs. Uh, budget and timeline cannot be treated separately. That's something that you need to sort of uh, wrap your head around. I'm still wrapping my head around it. <laughs> and um, since production time will affect your project costs and vice versa. So um, let's see. Just want to, we're going to get into some. Uh, oh, a second. Yes. Okay. I will. I, I'm sorry. Oh. Oh. Yes. Yeah. I can read the question out in the chat if it's uh, more helpful. And sorry to interrupt you, Pascal, but uh, Philippa was asking: As an artist, do you need additional insurance to do these projects beyond a typical liability insurance for your business? Or do you need a specific contract with your clients? Um, yeah, well, that's a really good question. I do mention it, but uh, I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer that right now. Uh, so yeah, there are di uh, different types of insurance. Uh, one of them is uh, insurance during the making of your art piece. Uh, this makes sure that if, I don't know, there's a fire or something, and then all this art piece that like, which is in the course of production is lost or damaged, then you have insurance on that. Um, there's also insurance that covers uh, the art piece uh, after it's been installed. Usually it's a for three year period. Um, so then afterwards you're not liable anymore. Um, there's only one insurance company in Quebec that, uh, that uh, does um, that type. Yeah, it's Assurar, uh, A-S-S-U-R-A-R-T. Um, there's also another kind of insurance, which is one that insures your studio year round. There's a lot of expenses, you know, so some artists choose not to do that. They just, they'll have a general insurance, but they won't have one for an artist's studio, um, but they do insure their studio. So again, that would be up to you, that part. I have insurance everywhere, it's, and it's expensive. It's a lot of, uh, it's, it's, you know, not something that when I started, I, I was just, you know, <laughs> praying, <laughs> praying everything would go well. But, uh, but during production, uh, you will be required on public art uh, projects to have some form of insurance, and that will be put into your budget. So it, it's covered. Does that answer the question? I guess so. Um, OK, so. Um, oh, Philippa yeah. says yes. Thanks, Pascal. Okay, thanks. Uh, right. Okay. So I'm, I was. I'm going to just change this. Uh, select another document for Table One because uh, this is um, this document is available. Um, uh, let's see. I think it's here. Sorry. Give me a second there. Ah. Um, can I just stop the screen share for a second? Does that work? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, let me just try to find it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. 
What's happening here? Okay, got it. All right, so I'm going to show you, this is a little exercise I did, and I think um, it can really help in understanding your worth and how much you should be actually charging when you're calculating or how much you should be evaluating your time. I mean, some of this, um, I even have a hard time, like, you know, initial inventory. Well, that's the stuff that you have in the studio in terms of your artwork that's being, um, I, yeah, some of this stuff I really have, I struggle with. Um, <laughs> but I know that this is something that my accountant has prepared for me. So the initial inventory, I think it's, it's the artwork that's in the studio but it has a worth and, um, and it's sitting there and it's kind of like a potential of what you can, what could be sold. Um, but somehow that is calculated as a percentage of what you have in your costs, your merchant, the cost of your merchandise. I'm not sure exactly that part, particular part and I should have asked about that first before showing you this because I look like I know what I'm doing. But. Um, okay, anyway, the, the point is here that you will be spending money on, um, uh, so the, the column here just shows you what you will be uh, uh, spending money on, or you know, what, how much it costs to make your art, to do your purchases, transportation, packaging, subcontracting, if you have any, in my case, I put a lot because I, the, some of it I subcontract. Uh, studio supplies, equipment, uh, maintenance of your equipment tools, you know, so I just I'm putting some very reasonable costs here for a smaller studio. And then you have the how much it costs for like salaries and social benefits. Now you're going to go what 30,000. That's not a lot. But hold on. It's just it's just uh, it's very, very basic um, insurance, uh, fuel, if you and electricity, depending if you have a car or not memberships, uh, do, you know, travel expenses, uh, representation, representation could mean like you're going to meet clients, so you have to drive or take a, uh, an Uber somewhere and bring some boxes of samples, you know, this is for a year. So, you know, anyway, you can kind of look through that and you'll see like what happens here if you put all these expenses together, you, you have some, you know, general uh, idea here of about $66,000 of expenses. This is sort of a, a very rough um, estimate of, let's say, a, a, a sort of middle uh, young art, I, uh, middle young art studio uh, that has, you know, some professional experience already. So if you would, what would happen with this if you split that table into 2000 hours, which it represents about what a year, um, uh, a years of, of hours spent working, uh, you would come up with something that's like 33, uh, $33 uh, $44 an hour. However, um, let's see, I just want to go back to this now. Oh, why does it not do that? I, I'm not sure how I can shift back into my my files. Um, okay, I'll just stop share for a second. Sorry about that. And um, just open this back. Okay, so this table. Right. Okay. Sorry about the little uh, little glitches there. Okay. Okay, so when when I've done this calculation, um, I just wanted to explain that that's an hourly sort of a base hourly production cost. So it's like if you're running your studio, the studio well, obviously is not running itself, it, you're in it and you're having all these activities. So it might be even less than that. If you're just starting, you have a small studio, it might be $20 uh, production costs an hour or, or something like that, however you can make it work for you. However, like I put your salary, yours, mine, whatever, $15 an hour, that doesn't make any sense. So if you adjust the salary, add $25 an hour to this hourly 
cost of like how it is just to run the studio. And then you add contingencies. Contingencies are what can happen if something goes wrong. So I've just put in an extra $5 an hour and then saving for the future, super important. You add that, then you come up to something that looks like $63.44. So it's not just your salary, it's like life, you know, just this is how much it costs. So, so the, the hourly production cost in the first the table one is not your salary. It represents the minimum production cost for the maintenance of your business all year round and during production. So, you know, you add to this rate by taking into account factors such as a salary that reflects your level of expertise. So I just put in 25, you, I mean, you put in 50, I mean, you know, whatever it is that makes sense to you. Um, contingencies, so um, I've added about 20%, which is makes makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of things that you have to, you didn't think it would cost this much than it does. And then setting aside funds to allow you to pursue a long-term career, avoiding a precarious hand-to-mouth situation, which I know a lot of artists uh, have at the beginning, but hopefully not by the time they've matured in their production. You know, so you, I mean, already if you have that mindset of thinking, I've got to put that five percent every time, you're going to secure yourself something on the long term. So. It's a little dry, all this like budget and money stuff, but um, it's it's essential. And uh, so it's yeah, so yeah, 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 crazy essential, exactly. Um, yeah, and I've been doing this for twenty five years, and so when I started out, I was living hand to mouth, and uh, you know, kind of going, oh no, I, how am I going to do for this? And calling friends and. Uh, my parents and you know just trying to you know anybody around that could just you know help me with groceries and things like that so i know what it's like and that's i didn't have um this kind of um help or somebody to give me some kind of like no no, no that's not what it should be looking like so when you have friends that are artists around you and everybody's struggling you're like oh i guess it's an artist's life it's like no it doesn't have to be like that at all <laughs> you know <laughs> like yeah we all agree on that um so um so yeah so then if you look at additional expenses uh you'll have you know, you might have office equipment uh, that can, uh, and accounting for obsolescence, unfortunately, some stuff five year span if we're lucky. Um, and uh, travel costs, uh, you know, that might be daily expenses. I wrote gas, but it could be, your, you know, just your subway card. And um, like I said, maybe some Ubers here and there. Um, and yearly travels, maybe if you're going to art fairs, exhibitions, uh, you might have to rent a van, uh, bus passes, you know, all of this stuff, that's kind of, you know, additional expenses. So the, the budget I gave you, um, that, that table one, you fill it in however you, want, you feel comfortable filling it in, but I would say fill it more than less, because that will really give you a lot more of um, an idea of really how much it costs. Um, exhibition fees, if you have them, or you know, you might have to build a booth, a plinth, um, um, booth rentals, uh, if, if that, and insurance, electricity, meals, lodging. Um, uh, vehicle, I wrote that in French. <laughs> okay, and um, so yeah, if you own a car, uh, you know, there's a lot of costs involved in that. Um, and then salary again, as I wrote, adjust it as an example one. So you will will be adding more to that base base baseline of fifteen dollars an hour, which I put in as like going. I don't know. Which I'll just you know be very very um, uh, pessimistic. <laughs> um, and then labor. So calculate your hourly wages for assistance as a separate item in your studio's hourly wage. So at rate. So if you have if you do your yearly costs, you know, and go, oh, well, how many times will I need to have some help that I'm going to be adding? Just put it in there, round it off. You know, it might be three times a year for five days, you know, so that's like 15 days and say, okay, it should cost about this much. If you can plan ahead and just add that in so that next year, you know how to put in your, your fees so that they make sense to you. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into a lot of details on this table too, but this is all available on uh, <clears throat> on the um, um, 
on the Google Drive. You can just download that. So essentially for this, uh, this would be like a typical quote for the 1% they require you to put in like how much hardware, uh, you know, how much hardware costs, so, like the nuts and the bolts and everything. They just really, really get into details. Uh, but you can, you know, go through that and see um, how that would uh, how that would work. I'd, I'd rather show you the other table, which is uh, a less detailed one, uh, but you can compare both of them and see what you're comfortable uh, with. If I can access, yes, okay. <laughs> I don't know how to switch around from one document to the other one I screen share, but um, uh, bear with me. Again, I have to stop the screen and get into that document. Um, that would be, yes. Yeah, I know. Okay, so you, you, you can help me out for yeah. that one. Okay, perfect. So right, right now I'm, I'm on that one. So share screen. <coughs> yeah, so oh, it's just giving me show. that. Oh. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, there was, uh, sorry guys uh, that are online there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was a little, just a, a little issue. Okay. It's not okay. Um, I just clicked on the wrong uh, icon. Sorry, guys. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So it's this one here. And then that should work. <clears throat> Is it working? Ah, okay. So, okay, this one's a little bit more uh, of a simple uh, breakdown. So there's just, there's not, you know, like how many um, bolts and how much they cost, uh, but it's just a little bit broader. I like this one because sometimes I find that clients or the, maybe the designer or the art consultant or whoever's looking at the budget, they, they, they're gonna get into your, your business. I don't want them getting into too much of my business and how I run my, run my studio so I give them what I think is really essential and critical and then I don't uh, yeah I don't you know they're, they're not going to tell me which kind of bolts I should unless I need to know that information but I, I choose to to do this a little bit more simply and it still works perfectly fine it's still transparent it's just that you know sometimes they don't understand all the complexities of something and they're going to start at whittling or trying to work into something and it makes it all complicated and it's just better to if they want to to talk about budget and adjust budget i'd rather that we do it on other items items that i'm comfortable with and that are more that make more sense to me and my expertise okay so um, you, um, this is, you know, an imaginary project here. So, you know, obviously put your coordinates and then, you know, that you'd have a quote, uh, number, date, the name of the project, your contact, the client, address, etc. So in this case here, uh, you would you describe the di uh, general di dimension of your work. This is uh, two murals in a main entrance. So whatever it is that the client called the project, you just put that in there. And, um, and the, here I would write, I wrote in specified material, whatever that would be, and I wrote glass frame, but you know, all of these things would be just a general description. So when, when the client or maybe the general contractor or the architect or somebody else has this in hand, they know what we're talking about. And usually they might even have a purchase order number. So that would, you would put that somewhere, which is not on this one here, but uh, then you would put that in so for reference so that they know if they find this document, they can look at where the art work is going. <clears throat> so I put in here uh, development and ideation. So I put it in a bulk. So this is how much time it's going to take to think about the artwork, how am I gonna, you know, the hours I spend on that, uh, you know, research and, and coming up with, with the general idea. Um, production, 
on this is like how much it costs to produce the artwork. Again, the other one, the other table will be very spe uh, specific and you might actually, now that I'm thinking about it, we should look at it because it'll help you see how much it costs for production sometimes. Um, yeah, it's good to, to remember why I, I put that in. <laughs> uh, you know, packaging and material handling, uh, transportation of artwork and insurance. So if you see the insurance is already in here. So um, here what I wrote is what is included. So in um, the first one, development and ideation, it includes plans, elevations, and schematic illustrations. So here I wrote up to three iterations. This is when I'm it's more when I'm talking about a public artwork that is uh, from a private um, uh, institution. They might have like the CEO of the, I don't know, whatever, the hotel who's like, well, I don't know, I want to understand uh, this and there's gonna be a little bit of back and forth. So in that back and forth, I wanna make sure my time is being uh, respected on that. So that's why, and I'll say, well, you know, and I put in up to three, that's like three modifications, three iterations, that's it. You know, we, we stop there and then we'll have to start billing again. So it's a, it's a way to protect yourself. It's also sending a signal. You're not just working for free, coming up with ideas and then they're gonna just scrap them all, you know? So just really important to do that. Um, and then uh, 3D schematic renderings, layout and uh, layout according to plans and elevations received from the client. So I always write that down because sometimes I'll say, well, you know, uh, no, that's, there's a misunderstanding. It's like, well, I'm doing this according to the plans and elevations that were provided by the client. So some, some of this wording is just really feels good afterwards because then there's no uh, communication uh, uh, problems. Uh, technical details, um, materials, overall dimension, components, sizes, quantities, samples, if the client wishes to proceed with a project, oh yeah, so this is important, if the client wishes to proceed with a project, following the approval of the drawings, the development phase will be deducted. Okay, this is something that is optional. Don't, uh, that I put that in, but I, I forgot to mention that uh, on this particular document, but that is optional. Sometimes I have clients who are like, well, you know, we really wanna see um, all three iterations of, of your ideas. And it's like, sometimes um, they don't want me to charge for that. And so uh, depending on the client, it's a really, it's a very personal decision. I don't recommend it when you're starting, but I do that sometimes with clients that I've been working with for a long time. I'm like, okay, you know what? Like this one's on me, this hours of like sketching out ideas. They're not going, they're gonna be rough. They're not gonna be, I'm not gonna be spending money on a renderer for $500 or whatever. And then, you know, but uh, if you like it, uh, then I'll just uh, like just, send me, you know, here's, here's a bill for $2,500. I will do your, uh, your sketches. And then if I get the contract, I'll deduct it. So then they're, they're like, okay, uh, this is, I can give you that money. And, but that's really a personal decision that I make. And um, so, you know, it, but it's a way to sort of like get the person feeling comfortable. And if they don't know you very well, they might be like, you know, I mean, I always think about like if you had a piece of clothing designed for you, you know, and then you're like, well, yeah, but if I pay you and I don't like any of it, you know, I'm never going to wear it. Right. So there's a, it's something like that, that I've sort of, um, I figured out a way to like communicate with clients. Again, I don't recommend doing that if you're not comfortable with that. It's just really a personal thing. But I thought I'd throw that in there because sometimes it's like a way to negotiate and getting them to have confidence in you and trusting you and going, okay, this person's, you know, on my team as well. Because I like to think that we're working together. Yeah. Um, right, so shipping, the price mentioned is approximate and subject to change without notice. I put that in because sometimes, and the final price will be approved by the client, the customer uh, before shipping. So it's a quote, right? It's not an invoice. So that's why things can shift and move and gas prices can go up and so forth and so forth. Um, and here what I wrote is not included and to be determined with the client. So this is something that I always put aside. It's installation and I uh, sometimes I put three options. So in this one I put in 
uh, option one, which is installation by customer's general contractor. Uh, detailed instructions and templates are provided to installers. So that means you got to put that your time in how much time it's going to take you to give those instructions. So that will be in the price of the artwork. You're putting that in. Like I said, you can you can break that down, but I usually just bundle it. Um, so those are and then the artists and their project ma manager will be available during the installation via teleconference. So this would be something where the client doesn't want to spend a lot of money on the installation or it might be because it's overseas. So how, how, you know, if you give them proper instructions and installation and you're available, you know, if they have any questions and that's a much more affordable option for them. Uh, but sometimes they're really nervous. They're like, no, 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 we want you to be there. So I always put the option two, which is a supervision by the artist and assistant, well, here I wrote two days, uh, labor, equipment not included, of course, and um, meals and accommodation, transportation for the artist and assistant, and travel insurance. So that is something that they might want to pay for you. They might pay for your, your, your plane ticket um, and hotel and travel accommodation because they want you to go on site. And then it's your time when you're there. Uh, I usually go time and a half for everybody. That, like if I'm bringing an assistant, they get paid time and a half because they're not they're not home. So it's it's a very different. Uh, it's it's more expensive, and also for myself. So this way they have the options. So like, well, you know, if you don't want to spend any money, fine. We'll be there. We'll be available. But if you want to, then then we'll. Uh, gladly go <laughs> travel. Pascal, can I interrupt you yes, for a second please, just yeah. to read out a few uh, questions and comments online, yeah. if you don't mind. So yeah. you, you see them popped out on the big screen there. A couple of folks are asking about your Google Drive folders and if they could get access to them to follow along. Is there a link that we can share in the oh, chat yeah. Yeah. to follow along to the Google yeah. Drive? Yes, I will do that. Awesome. Okay. And me... then Marie-José has a question as well, maybe uh, that I can read out. Comment, comment évalue-t-on la part des assurances pour chaque projet? Right. So, um, to evaluate your insurance, pour, uh, en français, je peux répondre aussi, um, uh, il faut parler uh, avec la compagnie d'assurance. Donc, uh, il faut téléphoner la, la compagnie d'assurance. C'est eux qui vont faire l'évaluation. So, um, the insurance company, you call them, you explain to them the nature of the project. And that's why, like I said, Assurar is the only specialist, but we have one that's great, who uh, specializes in, in art, uh, in, insuring art and artists and their studios and the artwork. And so you need to give them the value of the work, uh, the nature of the work, and they come up with that, um, that um, um, evaluation. That, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, and I have to stop sharing so that I can send you the link. Um, okay. And maybe while Pascal is doing that, I'll, I'll tell the people online that um, you're more than welcome to come into Fourth Space for this afternoon if you're available to do so. I mean, obviously, we got a great group of folks here around the table with Pascal uh, ready to dive into this work from morning onwards. Uh, but if you're online and you feel like you'd get a little bit more out of the workshop, by coming in to participating, working with small groups in the afternoon portion of the workshop. You're more than welcome to do that after the lunch break or whenever you feel comfortable, if you have the capacity to do that. So just extending that invitation otherwise. Uh, Dana is asking what time. Uh, I think we're taking a lunch break, Pascal, around noon or is that right? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think it was noon or uh, 12.30. Uh, I'm, I'm fine, I don't know, okay. I hadn't, uh, determine that. I feel like there was a schedule sent to me, though. Yes, we'll, we'll find that schedule. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, let me just uh, reshare. And I should be good with that. Yes, okay, and then I'm going to put the link in the chat. All right. So we got that. Okay. Um, so now, I, oh yeah, okay, perfect. 
So uh, yeah, there's a definitely, we'll have some time to, you know, question and answers. Uh, I don't know what time it is. So oh, yeah, 11. Okay, perfect. Uh, so yeah, so identifying participants, uh, this will be something that's really important as you go into sending quotes or preparing your quotes and who are you going to send it to. Uh, so you want to make sure you send your, your quotes and payment or, or know who's going to pay you. Um, so you have purchasing agents, purchasing agents that are usually on large scale projects and those people, uh, they, so it's basically the client uses a service. So they give them the money and they say, you manage it. So they'll have somebody, th those purchasing agents, so those are on large scale, hotels do that a lot. Uh, and uh, so that they're the ones that you would be dealing with for the payments, which I find great because I'm not dealing with any personal issues. These are just, you know, where's my money, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and they, they don't care whether you're impatient or, <laughs> or, uh, or in a good mood, um, preferably in a good mood. Um, so deposits. So I always ask for a 50% deposit to cover all contingencies and pay my suppliers. Uh, the, I know that for the 1%, I think they function differently. They do give you, they're the ones that determine uh, what, how, what you will be paid. I think it's like 40% or something like that. And then they go incrementally uh, depending on uh, where you're at in the production phase. Uh, I'm unfamiliar with that uh, part, but I've, I was asking around to other artists who do a lot of 1% and they said it's not, it's rarely uh, 50%. But uh, in, in the world in which I, I mostly work, that's what I ask for. Uh, then um, before the artwork, I, I take pictures of the work as it's in, in progress. And when it's ready to ship, I take photographs and then I ask for 40%. And I, the, sometimes 50% and then we just ship it out. But uh, the, often they're going to ask, client's gonna ask a, a 10% retainer fee. That is just to secure that there's nothing that's going to go wrong once the artwork is up. Um, if there's something that you know that you need to like the or they need to fix because it's up, you're back in it, back in, and uh, they you can't do anything about it. They may retain that ten percent. It's happened to me once. Um, it's not fun because you know, want my money, but, uh, but at the same time, we didn't have any issues with the client afterwards. And actually, I worked with that client again after and they just thought, okay, fine, you know, you, 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 you dealt with something, I dealt with it, you know, financially. So, uh, but yeah, 50, 40, 10. Yeah. Sorry, um, the retainer in that circumstance, was it honored based on another timeline that you agreed with the client? Yes, so retainer fees, tend to be between 10 and 30 days. So that's something that you determine and establish, and that's usually on your, um, uh, yes, on your contract and your, uh, and not your quote, but your, your invoice, you'll say, or you can put it on your, your quote as well. So this way, you know, you have your payments. That would be on the second page. Payments, you know, this is how, this is how it's done in my studio. Again, just remember that you can, in most circumstances, except the 1%, but uh, um, you should be the one determining how you want to get paid. It's not the client that should be doing that. So just remember that and, um, and you know, just write that down. And if there's some negotiation, just make sure you're really padded on your deposit. You need to um, imagine that the artwork, uh, you, you've made it and it's not, um, it's not going to happen then you want to have it everything covered. So that's that's how I uh, I calculate it. Um, is so yeah. Huh? Is that similar to a kill fee or With, are we talking about something that like you're saying with the movie art that doesn't happen? Yes, that so. could that that has happened where we produced the art and it just took about five years before they finally got it out of my studio. But even then, I've actually, that's a little thing, I've charged them for um, the storage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, just calculated my space, my studio, and not just my rent, but my yearly cost. Mm -hmm. You know what we're looking at the first, first thing? 
was like 60 or whatever, it was like uh, 40 or $33 a, an hour. Well, that's like kind of rounded about into a monthly, well, not, not 33, but divided by the amount of space I'm using on that, and then just breaking it down and, and that comes up to, that's how much it's gonna cost you. So it's on them, they, they decide or not. It's like establishing, really establishing your boundaries. It takes a long time though. <laughs> Just saying that because it, it took me a lot of, uh, a lot of learning and, um, but that's, um, that's why I'm, I'm really happy to be able to share that because I think like nobody needs to go through what I went through. <laughs> yeah, well, I, was, I was asking, I mean, that's, that's really great to know and it's good to establish that. Okay, hey, I will do, I will do this if you do not come to the piece for me. Um, and I, what I was asking was, is that similar? That's not obviously similar to a kill fee, but does the kill fee come into uh, play as well? Hmm. I've never thought about that. Yeah. Um, that could be something that you could add in your, um, because uh, let's say on your, your um, quotation on the second page, you have uh, a lot of um, like legalese, I guess, or you know what, you, how you're protecting yourself, but you could, you could add that. I'm not sure. I mean, I guess you would have to just calculate how much that costs, and uh, if you want to add that on top of your your 50% deposit, uh, if ever there's a, the artwork doesn't go, come through. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, by kill fee is that uh, to do with a, let's say a client annulling the contract midway or something, yeah, and you can retaining whatever you had agreed yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, is yes. That? Oh, yes. Thank you. That's true. Yeah, that if the if the client does uh, cancel it, cancel the contract completely, and that's happened to me. <laughs> Everything's I've, I've done them all 25, 25 years, but that that has happened, and we kept the deposit. It's uh, completely um cleared yeah yeah so uh, and that is in in the contract right. that is put in there yeah super important thank you for bringing that up um i tried to get all of those things in there but sometimes there's a there's elements like that and that's why the questions also i welcome the questions uh on, on that um so yeah lead time uh so you want to consider following uh the following when assessing feasibility of a project and the number of hours required to complete a project so you have uh the time that it takes uh, ideation so timeliness of this space impacts the following ones obviously so um scale model um in the case again of one percent i mentioned it a lot because you know I, I do encourage you to get your artwork in the art bank um scale models can take a few weeks to build and those they're required by uh, the one percent uh to like a physical maquette um and so you want to get plans and elevations early if that but you still need to get plans and elevations early even if you're not doing a scale model and uh, you might be saving time by building that environment while you're finishing developing your idea. Mm -hmm. So that's at least that's been done. You don't you don't wait, you know, for, for that part. Um, generally speaking, uh, clients uh, in other fields than one percent, they're, they're fine with renderings and sketches and you know whatever it is the format that the, that you've agreed upon with or that it has been uh, in a call out, they might say we're, you know, we want renderings or we want sketches or, um, so then there's technical development. So that's an ongoing phase. So it involves reviewing methods of production. Um, you wanna account for the time needed to communicate with subcontractors, engineers, fabricators, other suppliers. So there's a lot of time that's gonna go into that. There's a lot of management of your time. Um, a prototype and sample production. So, you know, that obviously ha you have to have your idea <laughs> set so you could do the prototype. Uh, and it allows you also to assess both the manufacturing methods and the costs uh, to produce the artwork. So sometimes you can do a rough prototype really early and then that'll change your idea as you go along. So you're, yeah, you're, you're kind of juggling those things, you know, they, they, they kind of come together. Then there's the actual artwork production, uh, and you will want to consider contingencies, you know, what can happen, and do create a pessimistic scenario. Just do, do that. 
just be that yeah. this is one place where you can go dark <laughs> it's like just just go there because you're going to protect yourself from things that you know when you're too optimistic yeah yeah i have time it's only in three months it's like oh no like that that's like don't do that yeah. don't do that you don't have time you know and then if you have time you'll have it after right so um obtain subcontractor quotes uh, to include in your proposal that takes time and you got to hustle and push them and call them and sometimes they don't answer and and uh, so you want to get those things done and you, you got to get a little uh, a little uh, on their on their backs uh, administration so you're going to have to take account for hours spent on administration communication producing estimates schedules and invoices writing reports producing drawings emails follow-ups it's a lot of stuff that, that goes into that uh, packing and shipping uh, there's a lot of it uh, in the end you'll be labeling and numbering components identifying and you know all of those things uh, clearly marking crates uh, boxes for, and boxes for the job site and that's something that I stress to put big uh, letters on everything so I've had uh, uh, projects where I have um, like 300 little boxes and so we put uh, labels with really big numbers on them so if I'm up on a scaffolding I can say, yeah, yeah, the box is over there. If you have these scribbled little finger, uh, I mean, hand, handwritten uh, notes, it's like, uh, you know, you can't find it. So you want to streamline that and uh, make things very visible. Um, securely packing art and coordinating transportation also takes time. So these are all the elements that take time. Uh, installation, so producing detailed plans, installation instructions, and a list of materials that takes it can take up to three days, you know, just like trying to figure that out. Um, so yeah, and, and supplies and just making sure you, your checklist is there. Uh, so also just a little tip there, contingencies always calculate an additional 20% of the total time allocated to the execution. So if you think you have two months, add 20% and just that, that's going to, you're going to feel Better, you'll sleep well. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that. I'm thinking about like just make your IKEA your instructions. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> IKEA, IKEA instructions. It's super clear. With exactly. Those, so. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, yeah, I do that, and have that somebody read it uh, mm -hmm. for you and go. Do you understand this? Mm -hmm. You know, they go. Well, what's what's that? You yeah. know, it's like, okay, uh, <laughs> clearly that I thought I was. Yeah, write it down. Exactly. So uh, this you know, gives me, uh, makes me dizzy when I look at this. It's the overview of standard procedures. I'm not going to read them out loud, but it's just to tell you how many, like there's 32 steps I put in there before the artwork gets installed. And it's all the stuff that, that's like, they're all the back and forth, back and forth with uh, clients so communicating, writing, ugh, you know, all of that. Uh, but you can uh, take uh, some time to to uh, read that and and I would recommend you taking the time to read that and going okay yeah and it'll help you to start thinking right hiring oh uh, yeah who, how should I when should I start doing that or you know uh, when should I start uh, purchasing production uh, you know the purchasing of uh, production materials or supplies or um, yeah when do I start doing my my uh, installation instructions so you know if you look at that that will this is definitely I've covered it all this is it's all, it's all there it's probably too much but um, better better too much than not enough so uh, staff this is something that I just put in there to so that you can um, think about that so production time can be shortened if you hire staff Again, if you've done a quote, if you've, got your, uh, you've done your invoice and you've received a 50% deposit in your quote, you have accounted for staff. So that you can put in assistant, you know, for whatever, whatever um, that costs or you've estimated the cost for that. Um, another thing, construction holidays. This is a really good um, a tip because uh, this happens to us all the time, but Factor in an extra two to five weeks because, and also ask your suppliers and subcontractors when they're taking their holidays or their vacation schedules. In the summertime, <clears throat> we have two weeks of construction holidays, but some people take it at the beginning of July, others are taking it in August, and then that might create a gap because maybe one supplier and the other are connected. They need to, to be working together or, you know, one is going to go into the shop. So 
really, again, just add, you know, just d double check. You want to pad yourself in terms of your time <clears throat> and your scheduling. <laughs> Subcontractor deadlines. Give them tight deadlines and allowing for potential delays that they will be <laughs> giving you. <laughs> I've, I don't know one subcontractor who does not, who does not, uh, who, who delivers on time. It's, I don't know, where are they? Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, so you, you don't, I don't give them uh, the real deadlines. Right. Never. Right. Never. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry to kind of make off topic, but on topic. Um, what are your thoughts on, so if the 1% is the, the determining committee. Is it what? The, the committee to determine. Yes. More, all of this process. Um, what, what are your thoughts on if the committee would be swayed positively as to the, an economical approach to production costs? Um, no, no, I, no, they're actually, this is one of the great things about the 1% is that they give you an established budget and with that, so all the artists are working with the same budget. Um, I mean, unless, unless you've taken like 70% of the budget just for yourself, you know, but generally speaking, they, is, they can, you know, they won't be surprised if you take 40% of the budget for your artist, uh, well, but, but split between artist fee and um, uh, what's it called? There's another, I have to look into these documents. But um, there is a, you know, they expect you to pay yourself. They also expect you to have, a, uh, what is it called? Um, uh, it's, it's not an artist fee, this is, it's another term. Yeah, something, yeah. you know what, I'm gonna look into that afterwards, but I, I'll, and I'll send it in the chat as well. Uh, but there's anyway, there's a there's a, a chunk of that that they expect you to, to put it. Uh, and actually, if you don't uh, give yourself the proper amount of like uh, uh, financial, uh, um, if you if you don't if you don't put that money for yourself, they may start thinking that you're going to uh, struggle mm -hmm. at the end of the project, and that can, you know, they're going to see that there's precariousness in, involved in that. That there's not it's not possible for you to be able to produce the artwork, you know, if you don't give yourself enough money to be able to be functional during that time. So there's, there's that evaluation can also be on that side, you know, so there's like realist, they're being realistic, you know, so they are there for the artists. Um, I, you know, even if I don't like their system for, for budgeting, but you know, that's just because I'm used to my ways, but, uh, but, um, but they, they do, they do make sure that you're not, uh, um, you know, yeah. like the only yeah. thing, yeah, the only thing that is a little stressful is that they do give you your check for producing the scale model only when you're, um, you're presenting in front of a committee, which means that if your scale model costs you $2,000, you have to front the money. So uh, and then they'll give you the money when you get to, uh, and they establish the same amount. For everybody so it's there's you know there's fairness in that regard um all right so um yeah so i put in a timeline just to show you like this uh, i like the visual timelines like this i find that when i put, i mean this is a very uh developed one probably a little too much for uh your clients but uh you know whatever elements in there that you find are critical i what i like about a visual timeline is uh, that's visual so people can sort of follow and understand things like you know where there's a construction holiday or there's like things that are ongoing um, that you can see that overlapping um, so yeah so calculated production time required to complete an artwork in addition to your yearly production costs allows you to budget your work run a studio and estimate a project's feasibility so that's just you know, really, like, I think we've got, gone through the, the really uh, uh, difficult uh, for me <laughs> budget part. <laughs> well, it's not that difficult, but it's just like some stuff. Uh, it's, it's not my, uh, it's not my cup of tea, but you need to do it to, to and, and you guys need to, to learn about that as well. Uh, any questions before we just look at the project scope? We're good. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so the project scope, you want to look at, there's going to be plans and elevations. So 
to evaluate feasibility, you need to request your plans and your elevations uh, of the installation uh, location. So consider appropriate techniques and materials within your expertise. Uh, request photographs and precise measurements from the client. Those are really important things. Uh, again, for the uh, one percent, oh, I'm missing a C there. Um, uh, so information on the overall dimensions is provided by the on the on the first site visit. But even when they do the art call, they send you uh, if you've been selected as the three artists, they will send you. You will already have all the information. You can start reading through and the plans and elevations are there, but there might be some things that you still need uh, that are a little bit more precise that you need to go on site with the other artists. And if it's with a, a private client, uh, they, you may not be able to go on site, so you might have to do this uh, via documents and, um, and uh, communication through email and, um, uh, or, or just via Zoom. Uh, but you need to have all that information or you can't do, you don't know if you can do that project, right? So uh, designers may not have all the information on a private commission at the time of your initial communication. So photos of the site and precise measurements are essential and so insist um, if needed to avoid delays resulting from lack of, of uh, commu uh, lack of information. So this will happen and this happens all the time. It's like I, I will get uh, someone asking me for art and I'm like, well, you know, where, where are the plans? Where are the elevations? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we're going to send that to you. And then it's like two weeks later. And then, they're, oh, we have a presentation with a client in three days, you know, it's like, OK, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> um, Okay, so yeah, so sketches and, and scale models. So you want to present, you could present sketches with technical specification to your client and you might include detailed drawings or realistic renderings. These are, depends on, you want to talk to the, to whoever's the one who's uh, asking you um, to, do, to do a proposal, what is it that they need? And if sometimes you're really at the beginning of a project and you're not quite sure, you might say, well, can we just send you sketches? You know, could that work or Photoshop or whatever, however you want to, something that's a rough, you know, something to start the conversation. But if it's a, a, an art call with a competition, it's a little bit more, they usually will establish all those things for you. So, um, you yeah, know, it just depends on the, on the type of uh, work that you're doing. Um, so yeah, you might have to hire an illustrator who specializes in renderings or if you're good with Photoshop or other editing software, then, you know, by all means, you know, you can do it yourself. But again, you ha you'll have to estimate how much time it takes and where is, where is it essential that you should be at while you're doing um, ideation. Um, so yeah, software and file formats. Um, usually, if you have plans and elevations, sometimes they're in CAD, uh, but you can request EPS format, which opens in a PDF. You can just the uh, uh, and or Illustrator, but but you send ask them to send it to you in PDF. You know, you don't need to to. Uh, but if you have a, uh, a, a, a someone who's making the maquette for you, they will need it in uh, CAD or EPS. Um, but they will tell you that. So you just have that. Um, if, I'm just throwing that in there because I know that um, that those questions arise really quickly. <laughs> I'm trying not to overwhelm you. Is that is everything OK for now? That's great. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, some free software you can look. I mean, this some of it is already a little old there, um, like that link to the French website. There's there's a lot of, um, you know, different different softwares that are available. Okay, so technical considerations. So obviously understanding your project's constraints and other factors uh, when preparing your estimate is essential. So considering is it exterior artwork? Is it indoors? Uh, that will make a, a big difference on what kind of work you're doing, right? So uh, we were talking about uh, public access earlier on. Uh, so it, when it's outside, you know, there's their um, uh, so there's the actual artwork, like it does it, you know, can people climb on it? Can they, you know, is it dangerous? Is it, uh, you know, sharp edges? Um, but also uh, when you're installing, uh, is there the presence of other tradespeople during the time of your installation? That can happen. Um, and then you'll need to do some team coordination. 
Uh, there's clearance that you need to think about uh, required to deliver the work and install it. So, uh, you know, do you need licensed contractors? Uh, if you do, you're going to have to, you know, get a licensed contractor. But they might have a licensed contractor. I always ask first. I go, well, don't you have somebody that can, you know, and then they, listen, they might say, oh, yeah, we have uh, um, not carpenters, but... Um, the other ones, uh, anyway, the, maybe sometimes there'll be people who are doing the painting and plastering because they're they're used to doing finishing. You know, they might be able to uh, provide that service for you. Sometimes the client will, uh, yeah, they'll they'll provide it because it's already on on their payroll and it's more simple that way. So this is really in terms of a private client. Uh, if you're doing an art call. Uh, generally speaking, you will want to have all the, that information uh, given to you, whether you need to have your own contractor install the work and if they need to have uh, their, if they need to be licensed, or is it something that you can do? Usually, you have a licensed, um, um, you need to be licensed if it's still a construction site, like it's open site, they say uh, chantier ouvert which means that everybody has the hard hats and vests and, and so forth, because there's a lot of back and forth. The minute the site has been finished, uh, there might be some plastering being done and stuff, but now it's no longer one that's that needs to be covered by this, the security um, insurance, whatever it's called, CNO, SST, uh, which would require the licensed contractors for installing. So I've been able to go on scaffolding and install stuff myself. So then they, they it's just all of that stuff you'll need to request or ask if if it comes to that. You know, usually they will tell you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so also if it's outside, uh, there might be weather conditions. And um, there's uh, types of mounting, uh, hardware required, and the strength of anchors on outside uh, work, or whether it's you need to dig really deep into the ground, the engineers will let you know about that if you're doing a big sculpture. Um, and then uh, you might want to have manufacturer's warranties for paints, adhesives, or you know, how long is this going to last? If I have something that's powder coated on aluminum, is this good for 50 years? You know, so you want to have paint and adhesives, they don't give you, they don't like giving you warranties because uh, it's, there's all sorts of things that can happen, like uh, different, like uh, cleaning compounds that have been used on paint that are incompatible or, you know, so they don't want to be responsible for that. So there's a few things that you need to sort of determine whether it's going to be critical or not. Um, and of course, insurance. So the same thing goes for interior art um, indoors. Uh, you want to find out if it's an active construction site. Um, and then the same thing for clearance required to deliver the work, uh, the presence of other tradespeople is pretty much the same thing. Uh, and uh, except the, the one little thing there, you know, d doorways, loading docks, you know, does everything fit? You know, will, the, will my artwork be able to go through the door, you know, did I make the crates a little too big? <laughs> they don't fit in the elevator. Guilty, that's happened to me. Uh, <laughs> we have to unpack everything <laughs> to fit in the elevator. We were missing about, I don't know, uh, three centimeters, you know? Yeah, so stuff happens. <laughs> um, yeah, or does, you know, yeah. Uh, do they have a, a loading dock? There's so many things that, that you, you can't think of everything. Um, but you'll be able to say, oh, yeah, I remember reading that in this, in this document. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so then <clears throat> maybe, uh, is there any questions before I get into the communication bit? We're good. Anything online? Uh, any? Any, because I see this little, no, nothing, uh, okay. All right, so the written word remains, yes, communication. Um, I always have a, a notebook to put my notes in because loose papers fly around and sometimes I lose them. Uh, so yeah, so you want to also um, 
uh, write down everything that if you have communications with clients, no matter what, just write down, even if it's just a really quick word there just to remind yourself, yeah, they mentioned that. Uh, you also want to know whom to contact. Um, so who is your main contact and understand each person's role. So that's why we spoke about that at the beginning. It's like who, who does what? And you know, you, you might not want to be you know, writing to um, um, the general contractor. Maybe they don't, they're not involved on this, but the architect is, I don't know. You'll be determining these things and you ask questions. Don't be shy to ask questions. Uh, to who you should be talking or sending or who should who you should be asking for your plans and elevations who is you who will you be sending your budget to so make sure you understand that and ask um, and then drafting an email so you want to make sure if you've received an email with a whole bunch of people cc'd don't forget to cc them all back when you're writing back to them there's a reason why they're doing that they want to make sure everybody is on board and that's probably because there's a big team you want to make sure those emails are you know it's clear and things are there um i put this in there for avoiding spelling mistakes because um you know it does reflect your professionalism and so there's a lot of spell checkers out there but but i always make sure that the spell check is really doing the, what it's supposed to be doing and sometimes it's not understanding it doesn't understand the meaning of your your um, um your communication so you want to review that take your time review it read it out loud if you need to and make sure that that's there i just really it's it's super important i find it really just uh sends a message so um and um yeah so teamwork um so in, in human resources is choosing the right people and knowing how to enlist the help of competent, reliable people are as important as having the right tools and expertise. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so I look, the, you know, these qualifications for people, whoever is working with me, I, I look for that. People who are really good at clear, detailed note taking and communications, that includes emails, drawings, et cetera, just really clear and detailed. Uh, they they have a commitment to delivering work that meets your expectations. You know, they're excited about working with you and they really want the best for you. <clears throat> There's a reliability and consistency in terms of their production quality according to your specifications. Um, they have an ability to meet your production schedule and they and your agreed deadlines. So I mean, it's a little bit of a hit and miss at first. You might be working with somebody that you will never work with again because they never respect their deadlines. So they just they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they, there's like radio silence. So, you know, it does take a while before you find the people that you're really comfortable working with and that you know they're always there for you and they really believe in, your, in the work that you're doing and they really want to help you out. And if they are really strong problem solving skills, you know, they have that, that's amazing. Like I have a really good um, engineer who loves uh, helping me out on, you know, technical uh, stuff like, will this artwork fall? No, it won't. And this is why. And, and look, I've just uh, figured this one out, maybe with this material or, you know, so the, it took me years to, to find the right people to work with and, I, and now i'm building a nice team of people that i know they're reliable they're excited about the work but it does take time you know and i mean if you're lucky and you have that already that's amazing and um but yeah it, there's a little bit of trial and error so um yeah so also just it is a note you know that i put in there but if you're unable to budget for the cost of hiring an assistant um, or you realize that that's what's happening, well, maybe for the next project, review your quote or determine whether the estimate is in line with your goals. So, you know, just that's why also that really long list of all the things that the 32 items between the art call and the finish, look at all of those areas where you might need some help. Uh, maybe you have somebody who's really great at like sending emails and like communicating and they go, oh, I'll call the subcontractor, you know, or I'll find someone for you. You know, if you can find that person and, you know, budget it in early so that you can start developing a team mentality, that's really, really important. Um, 
Yeah, so for um, generally speaking, you know, if you have a project manager uh, for if you imagine one day you're going to have a project manager in your studio. They would they exist. <laughs> I have one now uh, that person will ensure that the project runs runs smoothly and they act as a li uh, liaison between you and all the parties involved. So I, I, you know, these are goals, you know, it took me 15 years before I got a project manager. Um, but uh, it changed my life and uh, you know now uh, she she's the one who speaks uh, to the client and then she just liaises gives me the inf just the information I want I don't want the rest you know it's just just want to focus here you know goals. yes exactly <laughs> goals I'm I, I think I don't know a lot of artists um, it's like the micro the little detail and the macro the big picture you know but anything in between it's like oh you know, I don't know, just like get, get it done, right? So I don't know, but I find that, that I'm definitely micro macro and uh, finding someone who really loves just to, you know, cross the T's and dot the I's. And there are people that are there that they do exist. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of them. It's just. You need to have that to, to, to fill your lines. Exactly, mm -hmm. because, yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so. Yeah, so they uh, then, you know, an assistant, which is not quite a project manager, they would because you'll be the one leading the assistant, they're assisting you. But, you know, you do want to think about that for the future, you know, one day you'll have somebody at your side to support you and uh, your achievements. And uh, so, yeah, most artists that work in public art have an assistant at least. And, um, and so those, you know, you, you might feel at first oh, it's just training that person, it's just so complicated, I'd rather do it alone. Think about that again, you know, it's just a chunk of energy you need to put in um, at first. To tra yeah, 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 exactly, train them a little bit, and uh, then at some point, they'll start being able to figure out what you need and, and be there for you. So, yeah, because I hear that a lot. Oh, no, it's way too complicated, I'd rather do it myself. It's like, yeah, but look where you're at, you're still struggling, you know, that's like, like you have to do that. And it might not, the first person might not be the right person. You might have to go through another person, another one, and eventually you're like, okay, I know what I need. It's so much easier now. I can spot right away, it's not gonna work, you know, and, and then you kind of move until you find those people. So that's why I was saying like at first, you know, doing, doing public art and setting up your studio so that you can function um, on a larger scale it takes time and you do have it's incremental it's not it's not going to happen overnight or maybe it does that would be great i'd be excited for you <laughs> never know <laughs> yeah exactly um and then you know subcontractors those are people that you're going to be calling out contractually so uh they carry out aspects of production that you can't perform in-house uh and also just remember that your creative energy is precious and uh, your time is precious and plan your budget and deadlines to get the help that you need. So, you know, and this is the little tip here is just ask yourself the following question. Is there any added value to my artwork if I carry out this particular task myself? Does it or can I delegate? Yeah. Like, is there an added value to have somebody else crunch the numbers for you? Right. Right. Supposed to be painted by the artist, which is yeah, different. Exactly. Than, yeah. The other thing. Exactly. The other thing is like you know. Then you can you can look at the budget that's been prepared for you and go, okay, yeah. Well, I think we're missing this and that here. Let them fix that. You know. But like, I mean, just even like in my studio, sometimes I like to mop the floor because it's just relaxing and it gets my mind. But it's not because it's added value, right? Sure, sure. It's like yeah. it's just it's just I want to do it, you know. But I have I have assistants and they're the ones who mop the floor, you know, and and I'm okay with that. I'm right. not feeling like, oh, they're mopping the floor. I should be doing that. No, no, no. It's like it's fine, you know. Like I said, sometimes I just join in because I'm like, I wanna they're putting the music on, it's loud, it's fun, and let's all wash the floors together. Mm -hmm. I do ceramics, so it gets messy yeah, on the ground. Like yeah, music. yeah, it's ceramics, it's so ceramic. yeah, dust everywhere. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that one, just ask yourself that all the time. Added value. Mm, no. <laughs> all right. Um, so suppliers, finding suppliers with the same qualifications as those that were previously listed. Um, you know, they want to be there on board with you and respecting all of the things that you need. 
uh, expect the same level of service that you provide to your clients. If they start, you know, you're, you're giving your best to your client, you expect that people do the same with you. It's a matter of respect, right? So it's, and it's a reflection of who you are too, you know? Like at some point, if I have sloppy suppliers, I'm like, you know what, I don't need sloppy suppliers. You know, I'm gonna look for somebody else. Again, learning curves. I've, I've had to deal with sloppy suppliers, obviously. Um, so yeah, and request free samples on a, and a visit to your studio to discuss uh, specific projects. When I'm asking, when I'm talking about free samples, it's more like maybe someone who's like uh, a paint uh, manufacturer or some, you know, there's a lot of these manufacturers, they do have uh, traveling, um, you know, representatives. You know, you can say, you know, can you send me that? I really want to see the, what this material looks like. Uh, if they're not producing a sample, like an art sample, right? It's a different type of sample I'm talking about here, but ask, you know, you'd be surprised. Um, couriers, it's, it's your, if your time's limited and you can budget it, consider you using the service of a courier, especially in Montreal. Sometimes it's affordable. And during that time, you could be do some, doing something that's making your work go faster. Um, also, packaging material uh, should be securely packed uh, yet easy to unpack when you'll be on an install site. You don't want to be going, oh my God, like who put all this tape on this box? I can't open it. Whereas, you know, so you want to think about the unpacking as much as the packing. So you could do a test unpack. You can do it, make, you know, well, unless it's one big mass, massive crate there, but. Oh, but also crates. I've had that happen where I've they, they did a top like I, a crating company put all the artwork on the top of the crate. And the pieces were so heavy, like lifting them out of the crate was almost impossible. So now, you know, I always ask for a front front uh, loading. Oh, so yes. when you know, we take it apart, we open the front so we can pull it out little things like that. Yeah, yeah. So you do want to factor, of course, the cost of great production and packaging materials, um, clearly identifying boxes, as we were saying earlier, crates and envelopes to avoid wasting time searching for items on a job site, super important. And then in uh, a little tip here, like packing it material can, you know, accounts for about 5% of your overall annual costs in public art so you know you can sort of factor that in you know say okay five percent what does that look like in terms of my uh, yearly cost and then hourly cost for running my business it, it depends of course what your kind of artwork you're doing my stuff's kind of fragile so you know i do i do use it all the time so yeah, so most, uh, most uh, crate manufacturers will provide shipping services and that can reduce your administrative workload. So, uh, you know, coordinating shipping with a transport company. So if you have like an art um, crating company, they also usually work, uh, they can transport the work and truck it to your install site. Uh, if it's going outside of Canada, they can also clear do the customs clearance and all those documents you know that's a, it's a, it's a game changer game changer um, then um, and for expedition ask what their lead time and costs are to clear customs if you're if it's going outside of Canada um, and then here these are just rough estimates for lo local or regional shipments it can take up to a week to get somewhere on a job site international by air one to two weeks and by sea you can count up to Eight to 12 weeks if it's going by sea but if they're not in a hurry to get the artwork then that, that, that's fine um, so yeah these little tips about uh, shipping and crating specify your shipment dimensions make sure the truck can access your studio um, doorways elevators access ramps all of that same for the job site uh, including critical information about on-site conditions to make sure that they can bring that palette in with all this stuff in it. So, you know, those are things that you want to think about. I mean, this document covers a lot of stuff. So you should be, if you take your time to read it, <laughs> you should be able to go, right, right. Okay, I'll think about that. Um, so um, for installers, so you might need to hire installers with a valid work permit, as I mentioned. Um, and so you want to ask a general contractor requirements, you know, do you need uh, for equipment for lift wheels, you know, there's some they have a white or grayish light gray uh, 
wheels that don't mark the floors when the floors are like if it's a really nice granite floor they don't want to mark it so you want to ask for things like that for a lift um, and also whether you need to have like steel cap boots and hard hats and safety jackets and glasses you know just make sure to ask because sometimes they, they just take for granted that of course you're going to come in with your all your equipment and then you don't and, and then you're they, have, they run around, they find stuff for you because they always have um, hard hats for their guests or people that are visitors that are coming, yes, visitors that are coming to on the job site. But yeah, ask those questions. Um, yeah, so the insurance, which was a question that was asked before. One, the first one, the annual insurance for your studio, it's optional, but the day that you can't afford it, I would say take it because it's just, you can sleep at night, not worrying about, uh, things happening to your artwork, but it's a, it's a chunk of money. So uh, I, I understand when that we don't do that when we start. Um, so you need insurance to cover the project as it's being carried out. Uh, that will be uh, usually you, you have put that into your, um, your quote and then your invoice insurance. So um, an insurance coverage for the artwork after it has been installed. So I just write insurance. Uh, and then when the client asks, it's like, you know, I can specify to them, it's, it's covering the art as it's being installed and, and as it's being carried out. Um, this is just, um, uh, what time is it? Okay, we do have a, a little bit of time. I'm gonna actually, actually take a little bit of water. Thank you. And, uh, I just had to do that. Yeah, well, but I, 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 uh, we can do that a bit earlier. I don't know, but I did want to leave a little bit of room for uh, Q&A after this. Uh, yeah, I don't, yeah, are we good with that? Okay. Um, okay, so. <laughs> right, so file management is just something, how I organize my files on my computer. And uh, I just find it works really well uh, this way because everything goes into um, a logical um, uh, time timeline. So how I do this is like I, I name the uh, the main folder of the project, and within that main folder, uh, I will put in these different subfolders. Um, also, I don't know if I wrote it on here. No, I, I didn't. But um, I, to, for the main folder, I always write the year. So let's say uh, we're the uh, year 23, and the month comes right after 07-04. So when I do that, things will um, fall into, uh, into order. If I start with a day, then of course, after 30 days, it starts it messes up again. Same with the months, right? They're recurrent. So uh, if you start with the year, the month, and and the day, and then you name the the name the title of your project, then it fits into your computer really nicely, and then you can refer to them and go, oh, "What year did I do that? Oh yeah, that was in 2017." You know, you can just go into 2017, and all the projects are are there. Uh, so yeah, so I, I put in administration, so there's, and in that there's another subfolder called quote and another one called invoice, so I separate the two, and so in there, there will be all these items, uh, preliminary concepts, sample production, mock-ups, 3D modeling, artwork, uh, three uh, installation options, but that, that's inside the quote, that's not inside a sub, those are not sub subfolders, mm -hmm. it's just what would just a reminder of what's inside your quote. Uh, then there's the invoice um, and what's inside with estimated delivery time. Yeah, so this would be the default of payment warranties and limitations we were talking about when uh, earlier about um, what you want to put in if they uh, uh, there's a cancellation of the art or or you know if there's any delays or from the client's perspective and you know if you want to uh, state how much it will cost to store the work if it's not uh, if they don't they can't respect the delivery time on their end right so you don't want to be stuck with that problem um, so yeah and then the second document so as you see I number them as well so I go one to ten this way they they fall into line so then communications I put in 
all my notes, letters, emails, whatever, I just dump them in there. And I do always, again, put the dates, uh, numbers, I, I date everything. So they still, they all follow chronologically. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> Uh, basic documents will, will be the third one. So in that, ba my basic documents are, are what the client has sent me. So the mo their mood board, site photos, plans, renderings, everything that I need to start my project, I, I put it in that file folder. And then uh, on preliminary concepts, so uh, anything I'll put in there, it could be, these could be subfolders, like a, what's a previous project, so I might want to, you know, that reminds me, oh yeah, I put, this could, this could help me start, uh, you know, the project rolling, 3D drawings, anyway, there's a lot of different things, but you can see here, these are preliminary concepts, so anything like sketches, uh, I mean, you know, that I put on a piece of paper, I'll just, scan it and put it in there you know it's just i don't want to forget and this loose loose papers they scare me i mean i <laughs> they really scary because I, I forget I, yeah as you noticed i i i scatter a little bit <laughs> i look organized <laughs> but <laughs> ah, la, la. um anyway yeah so and then presentations so there's a preliminary presentation sometimes you'll want to be uh, working on or sending to the client oh here's what i think that it could look like um there's uh you know uh linked files and folders that's if i'm doing a uh, indesign or something you know and i need to have my linked files and then there's final presentation uh progress report i put it in there as well and then I have a, a folder that's called subcontractors. So everything I sent to the subcontractor, everything received from the subcontractor. So I have in that, I might have like five folders for different, so they're the names of my subcontractors. So I know where to go. It's like, oh yeah, this is, this is that one. What did I send them? What did it, you know? And then uh, there's the uh, production fabrication. So I here I put an example of ceramics. So, you know, I'll have a folder hand building, wheel throwing, modeling, glazing, and firing. So they're the different, the different um, uh, aspects of which I need. I might have like sketches or like notes that I have that are for different things like glazing. I might have my glaze recipes that are in that particular folder for the project. <clears throat> and for installation, uh, photographs of project report, project completion, um, and uh, yeah, so review of installation sequence. So this is something that I'll be putting in after once it's finished. It's like, you know, a post-mortem, you know, so it's like, what happened? What, what you know, how did it, what, what are the great things that, that we need to remember to keep doing? And what are the things we could adjust? You know, those are things, and what we, I do that really early, like the minute it's finished. And even during the install, I'm writing notes in my, oh yeah, next time, don't forget that. So because you, I forget after a week, I don't know, it's like, oh, yeah, it was great, you know, <laughs> or, and then you're like, ah, I forgot that again. And then promotion, you know, so I put my last folder, that's all, you know, fo photos of completed projects, social media, you know, artist statement, super important to have that. And so if you want to do a press release, you know, then you're already putting all of that in there and that goes there. So then you can refer back to that later on, maybe a year or two later and go, oh yeah, what did I write about that art piece? Because that reminds me of, you know, anyway, it's all about referring. So yes. So a quick question. Um, yeah. Um, I don't, I didn't really get a chance to see the whole budget, but I guess it's, we'll have to talk later, but is there um, a section for marketing? Yeah, so that would be, I would put that in the last one for promotion. Okay. Yeah, promotion, marketing. Uh, yeah, so you'll have your photographs there. You'll have your texts. Uh, like I said, the artist statement, maybe a description of the work, um, you know, and, and, or, you know, something that, you know, people go, oh, wow, like that's really inspiring now that now I've read this. I've been, you know, I didn't know what that little element was about that you're talking about your art, you know, you're just like sharing, sharing with them. Like yes, exactly. Oh, so the photographer would be, yeah, you could either put it, well, he's not a subcontractor, but um, I don't know why I just said he, um, sorry about that. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, you would put that, I would put that in the last folder with the, 
but however, if you're if they're invoicing you, then I would put it maybe I don't know. You 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 can make that decision, I guess, wherever you feel more comfortable. But yeah, definitely. Uh, but that's on you, right? The pho photography of your work, it's not on the client. Um, so you know that would be something that you'll determine where you're putting it. But that's a really good point. Definitely, getting uh, hiring a photographer is a very smart decision <laughs> to make because it really that's all that's left really afterwards um you know is like showing your work and making sure everybody knows about it so it's uh it can be a chunk of money but if you can barter i've done a lot of bartering uh yeah you know you, you do what you can right <laughs> or cooking a good meal or you know i don't know but, uh, yeah there's a lot of a lot of things you can do right um yeah, being friendly, <laughs> that pays off. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, again, it's like uh, foundations of, being, of having a professional art practice, creativity, methodology, craftsmanship, communication, and that's the one that is like that fourth element, communication. I think that's what distinguishes with public art and doing your own artwork. Mind you, communication is always important, even with art galleries and if you're doing shows and stuff, but... Hi. Um, yeah, so, um, I mean, we, we can, if you're hungry, what time is, yeah, if, if you're, you guys are hungry now, we could take a break now. I don't know, it's for people online as well. I just want to make sure that uh, that works for everyone because we had said a little bit uh, later, so I don't want to mess up that because the other thing I could do is uh, show, um, a proposal I could go and look in my files and see if I could show you what a proposal can look like that would be interesting. Yeah? yeah okay so maybe is that that okay I mean if anybody wants to have a little uh, snack or something before I while I look for that I mean yeah. sure okay yeah. okay, okay. Uh, is that okay uh, for people online because I don't know uh, who's taking care of uh, my people online <laughs> Hmm? We're just hanging out. Oh, they're hanging it out. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So I'm, I'm going to look for, uh, yeah, so lunch break. Will be, yeah. Okay, perfect. I will show you one uh, that I just did recently, which I didn't was not awarded for, so <laughs> I can show it. Oh, yes, I will send that to you right uh, in a second. Okay. Um, let's see. Where am I? So I think uh, I think we can have a lunch break yeah. and uh, Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. And we'll be doing exercise afterwards uh, as a group. So uh, it'll be like, you know, getting a pencil, paper, or computers, and uh, we'll have some fun, hopefully. <laughs> oh, one new message. Quelle l'importance de l'idée concept dans le projet? Okay. So maybe I'll keep the, well, Marie Jose, um, what, I'm not sure I understand your question. What is the importance of the idea? Oh, okay. OK, après, oui, merci, on va manger. <laughs> OK. All right. Um, OK. Yeah, one hour. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Indoors. Yeah, indoors, indoors. <laughs>